Good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Colin Scott. I'm the Assistant Director for Transfer Admissions here at Western. Uh, we've been hosting these um, events with our several colleges this week just to have an overview of some of the changes that they are incurring, some of the things that they think that might be helpful for your students. Um, after they do a presentation, uh, we'll let you um, ask your questions. Feel free to post those questions as they come to mind, um, and we'll get to them as, uh, as they come up. So all right, now I'm going to turn over to Tom, let him uh, introduce himself, and then we'll go from there. Yeah, good morning, everybody. My name is Tom Finnis. I'm uh, with Western Michigan University's College of Aviation. I uh, am responsible for the recruitment, marketing, and the outreach for the program. Uh, with me is also uh, Sharon Van Dyken, who is our Director of Academic Advising at the College of Aviation. Uh, so thanks, everybody, for meeting us. Uh, what we're going to do is uh, kind of give you a, a very, very quick and brief overview of our program, where we are, what it looks like in aviation, um, and, uh, and things like that. Then uh, Sharon's going to talk a little bit about, um, you know, what uh, is the best plan of action for students that begin their, their studies at a community college, um, you know, with the uniqueness of aviation, um, you know, uh, there, it does uh, call, or th there are some special things that students should be considering as far as what, what they are planning when they, they do start at a community college. We do get a number of students that are interested in starting at a community college because especially if you're looking at the flight end of things, the cost of aviation can be very, very high. Um, and so students then become very, very cognizant of that and they're looking at ways that they can help to minimize some of that uh, cost of education. And so starting at a community college is a very, very viable and a good option and opportunity for them. Um, but it does come with some other, uh, uh, some other things as far as considering. So uh, what we're going to do is, is uh, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to share my screen and do this. We'll start off with a quick little presentation here. Um, and we won't go over all of these things. It's just going to be, uh, I'm going to go very, very quick and fast over there just so we can kind of hit the high points, um, blah, blah, blah. Uh, just as kind of point of interest for a lot of you if you really want to see the success of our program i would encourage you to go to our blog site uh, we have an, a, a very vibrant uh, pretty active uh, alumni blog where we are we are focusing on stories about the success of our alumni and our alumni are out there in all aspects of aviation it's not just piloting aircraft it's fixing them maintaining them it's doing um uh, uh, clearance uh, in the management side of things. So I'd encourage you to go look at that. There's also, if you want to know more about the student experience uh, and our general blog, and usually you can find it on our homepage or um, there we have a general blog that really talks about where our students are, are, where they came from, how they got interested in aviation, what their dreams are in aviation. Um, we do offer the three the majors in aviation. So we offer our aviation flight science program, which is our professional pilot training program, our aviation management and operation, which is the business side of aviation. And then our aviation technical operations, which is for people that want to build, maintain, fix, or repair the aircraft. Uh, some points of pride for us uh, that we're very, uh, you know, not to brag or anything like that, you know, no, we don't like to do that too much here at the College of Aviation, but these are uh, some very, very strong selling points about why students are interested in pursue, pursuing a career in aviation at Western Michigan University. One, we are one of the oldest aviation programs in the country. There's about nine of us that are as old, or there's a few that are a little bit older than us, but we actually started teaching aviation back in 1939. So I think we're now into our 80, we'll be going into our 83rd year of aviation education. That's pretty darn significant when you think that powered flight only started in 1903. So roughly 36 years after the Wright brothers took off, uh, very wise people in Southwest Michigan uh, and it doesn't take a, a history major to realize that in 1939, there were some wonderful things happening in the world. Um, and But they were very wise in understanding that there was going to be a huge demand in aviation. And so they started it. We started as a, a maintenance program and very quickly added into the flight components uh, under the Army and the Navy Air Corps. Um, 
So over the 83 years, the program has evolved. It's grown. It's grown into the third largest aviation program in the United States. So right here in Southwest Michigan is one of the largest aviation programs in the country. But more important than the size, we also are very, very proud of our industry reputation. It's not uncommon that we are in the top tier or the top conversation when it comes to the best aviation programs in the country. Uh, if you do an, uh, a very scientific search i say that very sarcastically a, a google search it is not uncommon to find us listed in the top five or the top 10 best aviation programs in the country what we like to use more than that is is uh, the industry partnerships the relationships that we have western michigan university is one of three programs in the united states that's partnered uh, it, through the accelerated pathway programs with Delta Airlines through their Delta Propel program and United Airlines through the United Aviate program. There's only three of us, us, Embry-Riddle, Aeronautical University, and University of North Dakota. Uh, and then when you add in the other pathway programs that we have for our technical operations students through AAR Corporation and Delta Tech Ops, Western is one of one. We are the only program in the United States partnered with Delta Tech Ops, AAR Corporation for their Eagle Career Pathway Program, Delta uh, Propel, and United Aviate. And that's pretty darn significant. And it speaks volumes for the quality of our program and the industry reputation that we have. Uh, it is also very important for people to know that we live in two worlds. Uh, our students do, the majority of them live in Kalamazoo. That's where they take a lot of their general ed education courses. But our aviation campus is located over here in Battle Creek, uh, Michigan, which is about 18 miles to the east of, of Kalamazoo. And uh, we are located at the Battle Creek Executive Airport at Kellogg Field. A lot of reasons that we're over here. It, in, and the big reasons, it allowed us to grow. Uh, so when we moved over here in 1997 and we've grown and we've made and we've turned this airport into the third or fourth, we're usually duking it out with Pontiac for the third or fourth spot, busiest airport in the state of Michigan. So you've got Detroit Metro, you've got Grand Rapids, and then you've got usually Battle Creek Executive Airport coming in at third or fourth. That's pretty significant, especially when you think that the majority of the traffic, about 80 to 90% of the traffic is generated by us from Western Michigan University. There is no, there is no commercial air, tra or air uh, travel that comes out of Battle Creek. So when you look at that, that's pretty significant. Due to the growth of our program and the, the, uh, the, uh, the busyness of ourselves, we have just uh, built and we have now occupying our brand new aviation education center. So uh, on the screen, you can see a picture of, of the new building. It is a $22 million expansion for our aviation education center. It, it expands and it uh, elevates the student experience for our aviation students. So what we've done is we've added additional classrooms. We went from four classrooms to 11 classrooms. We have added in a student cafe. We've added in a paint lab for our technical operations students, which will eventually be put into the curriculum. It's not in there quite yet. We've added in a new sim bay. We have added in our advising office. Now, so Sharon and her advising team is now located in Battle Creek. Uh, our faculty is all housed under one area. So for us, this is truly the first time in 83 years that we've been around that we are all of us are under one roof and one home. And that's very, very significant. And it has been a, tr a tremendous benefit to our students. So looking at our flight science program, this is our largest uh, program that we have. Um, some important things, and I don't expect any of you to know this. That's why you have us at the College of Aviation. Don't You're probably like, what's all these crazy numbers on there? But we trained to the part 141 levels following the pro underneath the Federal Aviation Administration. That's the most, technically uh, advanced uh, uh, requirements and re uh, and regulations that the FAA, FAA has regarding uh, professional pilot. So it's very rigorous. It's very, um, there's a, uh, the, the standards are way higher. And basically the 141 world is working to train the professional pilots. We are not in the job of training recreational pilots. The goal is to go through our program and we're training you to be a future captain of a corporate or business uh, aviation department or an airline uh, or things like that, leaders in the industry. Um, we, our students can do 
to the private, the instrument, and the commercial, the, the private pilot's license, the instrument ratings, and the commercial multi-engine with a single engine add-on license as well. The, the students in those will finish with about 200 hours of flight time uh, based in the curriculum. Now, our students will qualify for the restricted ATP. The restricted ATP is um, airline transport pilot's license. That's a license that they need in order to fly professionally for the airlines. And with the restricted ATP, the, the students can qualify for that at 1,000 hours instead of the unregulated uh, ATP uh, at 1,500 hours. So our students get a 500-hour waiver, um, which is pretty significant. Now, a student can get their private pilot's license out of West, outside of Western, but that is the only license that they can bring. And if we do have a student at a, at a community college, while we don't endorse it, we also don't uh, discourage it. Uh, but if they if they are starting at a community college, usually if if I'm talking to them and I get them early enough, uh, and they say they're starting at a community college, it's not uncommon that I say you may want to think about getting the private pilot's license. But there's a lot of things to think about, and I'll share with you also our frequently asked questions page in a little bit, where you can find a more detailed explanation of what it's like to get your private pilot's license outside. There are flight lab fees. Uh, and again, this talks about the cost overall to do the private, the instrument, the commercial multi-engine. Uh, the students are looking at roughly an additional $70,000 on top of tuition and room and board. So that's why you start to see the connection with the community colleges um, because of the expense of this. Now, Western is pretty unique. This is an estimated cost. What we do is we take the FAA minimums for the part 141 training. The FAA says that you should go through all of these ratings and licenses at a minimum of about 190 hours of flight time. What we've done is we take those minimums, we add a 10% buffer on there. It's very important to understand students are only charged what they use and depending upon how they attack their flight training, whether it's the highly motivated, highly dedica dedicated, highly committed to their flight training, We've seen students come under budget anywhere from two to $8,000. On the flip side of that, we've also seen students go over budget by five to 10 to 15 grand as well. So it is ultimately impacted by the students. And I'll also share with, where you can find all this information on the website as well. There are uh, academic requirements for students. And it's very important to understand we are backlogged in flight training because of the demand of our flight uh, of our flight program. We are about two years uh, behind in getting our students starting to flying. So the, the academic requirements of students have risen very, very significantly. The minimum that they have to have is, at least as a Western GPA, is a 2.75 overall WMU GPA of 3.0 in their major. Um, coming in from a community college, it is not uncommon that we tell those students that they're probably going to sit at least at least one semester, if not a little bit longer. Our goal is to get them flying as soon as possible, but there is going to be a delay in, when they come into Western and start right away. Um, and then I'm going to talk about uh, the admissions requirement here uh, in, in a second. So when you're working with a student that is looking at wanting to come into flight, the, the keys are to hit the academics. The higher their GPA, the better it, it suits them. And once they get into Western, they want to shoot for as high of a GPA as they can get. Because it's, it's very important to understand that we prioritize flight slots based upon two criteria. Number of credit hours that, that they have uh, completed, and that will include the number of hours that they've completed at a community college, and then their overall GPA. Like I said, there's usually going to be a wait time of at least one semester. So then they come into Western, their goal is to get as high of a GPA as possible. If their GPA at Western does fall below the threshold, they either are not qualified to fly or if they have secured a flight slot, they will get grounded and they will lose that flight slot. That's how strict we are becoming with those flight slots. There's an FAA medical requirement for this. In addition, the, the students, and it's not, it would not be a bad idea that if they are starting at a community college to look at getting that FAA uh, uh, medical prior to coming to Western. We do recommend that, uh, we do require that they get a second class medical, but we, requ we require a second class medical, but we encourage them and strongly encourage them to get a first class aviation medical. They have to get the, the medical through a licensed aviation medical examiner that is affiliated with the FAA. 
And that first class medical, why we recommend it is because that is the medical that they need in order to fly professionally. And what it is, is it's an insurance policy. Before somebody goes through all of the training and then goes to get their first job in aviation to find out that they have something internally or cognitively that may preclude them from getting that first class medical. So by getting it prior to starting their, their flight training, it's just that safety measure that it's that insurance policy that I know I can get it now, which means I should be able to get it when I'm ready to get that first job. Now, the, I already mentioned that we are about backlog. We are about two years backlog in our flight training. So we send out letters to those prospective students. So if you are talking to a student that's starting into community college, get them tied up with us as soon as possible. We are very open and very transparent about all of this. And usually what I tell students is like, if I was talk, talking to a student or parent today, I said, what I'm telling you is good for December 16th at 10, 16 a.m. Because it could change on December 17th. That's how quickly all of these things are changing. Now, our goal is to get them flying as soon as possible. But we, and right now with that, backlog we are we are telling them it's about two years and that's typically for that incoming freshman student community college students typically we're telling you you're going to wait at least one semester if not longer depending upon the number of credit hours that you have and also your gpa now part of this also because of this backlog and this demand in aviation flight training we have initiated very very structured and strict uh application processes for First year students, we have a December 15th application deadline. And for transfer students, it's Fe February 15th. So for those students that are looking to be considered for a fall of 2022 uh, start, their application deadline is February 15th of 2022. Now it is it is a very competitive process. We have very we will have limited number of spots that we are allocating to all, to students, whether they're first time community college or or international students. So the most important thing that you can encourage them to do is give us as much information about themselves as possibly. We are going to be reviewing their applications holistically. I, if I was a counselor talking with a student that's interested in aviation, I would be encouraging them to put in a state, uh, their personal statement, letters of recommendation, an essay demonstrating their passion, dedication, commitment to aviation leadership, uh, all of those different things that help them to help to create them as that holistic person that is going to be very, very desirable for our program. So that deadline, we do anticipate, it's not only in place for this year, we do anticipate it also for fall of 2023. The other thing with our aviation flight science program is that we have restricted the admissions uh, to fall semester only. Uh, so we have removed the opportunity for any student to enter into the, the flight program in the spring semester, the summer one, or the summer two. Uh, career outcomes are amazing. The demand in aviation is very, very high. Salaries are back into place, and it is a, it's a great career path. As I mentioned the Delta Propel program and the United Aviate program. These are accelerated pathway programs that allows a graduate out of this program to get up to a mainline carrier as quickly as possible. There is an application process. It's an interview process. It's basically they will walk away and as as uh, possibly as, as soon as their sophomore or junior year, they could have a conditional job offer with Delta or United Airlines. This, there's certain components that they have to, to meet, but that's a pretty interesting thing. Our aviation management operations. This is really the business side of aviation. Now, the interesting thing about aviation and uh, all of those constraints that we talked about in flight, the, the application process, the, the, the backlog, do not exist in management or technical operations. These are the admissions process for management and tech ops are open year round. We are admitting students into these programs at all different semesters. So we do have opportunities to grow these programs, but the flight program is much more structured. Uh, structured. The, the management operations program is kind of, is basically a hybrid program. It's really for that person that loves business, but has a, an, an undeniable passion with aviation. The interesting data and fact about aviation is that only about 15% of the employees in the aviation industry are pilots. The other 85% exist in the management and the operation side or the technical operations, the maintenance side of aviation. There's tremendous growth in these avenues as well. 
So in the management operations from a community college standpoint, there's a little bit more course offerings and Sharon's gonna share what some of those may be uh, in a little bit. Um, because students can take things like economics, they can take uh, some uh, business classes, um, in addition to some of the, uh, the, the general education courses. In our degree, there's an airport emphasis that's built into it. There's a lot, there are some additional minors that students can also add into that makes themselves very, very marketable and desirable in this industry. You look at where these students go. And again, the career outcomes in here are very, very positive. Some students go work for the FAA, working in the regulatory agency. Some people will go work for an airport uh, and go into the operational side, whether it's Kalamazoo International Airport, the Detroit Metro Airport, Chicago O'Hare, Denver, San Diego, wherever it might be. And there are tremendous job opportunities in those airports. Airports are essentially small little cities. For example, Dallas Fort Worth has 80,000 employees at Dallas Fort Worth. That's the size of Battle Creek working at an airport. So then imagine what, what, what uh, uh, Atlanta Hartsfield must be. It's the world's largest airport. And there's probably double that people working in Atlanta. So there are a lot of job opportunities. The salaries are, are in here. Uh, and it is a great opportunity for students. Other areas that are, are ripe for growth is the aviation technical operations. Technical operations is the people that want to build, fix, main, maintain, or repair the aircraft. The industry is terrified because while the private pilot shortage is getting a lot of the press, what is right behind it is the, is the, the technical operations or the maintenance shortage. There's a bad joke in aviation that says, uh, what are pilots without uh, uh, tech ops or aviation manage or maintenance people? They're just guys and gals standing around in leather jackets and cool sunglasses because without tech ops and, and maintenance, airplanes don't fly. Uh, so these are vital into the, the component. Now, this is a very hands-on curriculum. Uh, and what it is, is uh, the, there are certain qualifications that students have to meet uh, in order to qualify for the FAA airframe and power plant certification. That is the license, the certification that's issued by the FAA that allows any, uh, somebody to do anything mechanical or structural on an aircraft. It's called an airframe and power plant certification. So really with Western, what it does is it prepares people for the best of all worlds. They're going to get the technical training that they, ne they need in order to do these operations. They're going to get the certifications that are necessary. And they're also going to get a bachelor's degree because we're pretty unique in that and that we offer a bachelor's degree on this. And what that really does is it allows our graduates to be the masters of their own destiny. So if they want to stay on the floor and they want to turn wrenches for the next 10 years, 15 years, they can do that. But 10 years down the line or 15 years down the line or five years down the line, if they want more out of, out of their career, if they want to ascend that corporate ladder, if they want to become the, the maintenance manager or the project leader in an area, with that bachelor's degree, it does set them up for that future success in, in the, the career ladder. There are some flight, or excuse me, there are some uh, lab fees that are associated with this. Nowhere near the 70 grand for flight. There's going to be about a, a $2,000, $2,500 uh, lab fees that are associated with all of the classes that are involved in this. Uh, and there are a set of tools. It's very probably similar to the automotive technology programs that a lot of community colleges have. And the same thing is, is true in our technical operations. The students have to have a very basic set of tools. And what they're doing is it's an investment that they're making in themselves uh, for their future career great career paths and it can go into manufacturing it can actually go and work in the airlines some people may go into working at an mro like uh, duncan aviation which is right across the way from us which works on corporate and business jets some people will go in and they want to become part of these pathway programs i mentioned the aar eagle career pathway program or the delta tech ops um, so again these lay out the foundation for how do i get to these places if that's where i want to go uh, so these are all uh, very, very great things to do. So um, I'm going to stop there because then the, all the, the rest of the stuff is just kind of basic Western stuff that I'm sure you've probably heard about student life and residence halls and all those other things. But that's kind of just an overview with our aviation program. What I want to uh, just do before I turn it over to Aaron or excuse me, Sharon. <laughs> Sorry about that, Sharon. Uh, before I turn it over to Sharon. Uh, is just if you've never been to our website, there's a variety of things that you can find on it. So uh, I mentioned the frequently asked questions page. If you go to future students, 
and you'll see underneath future students is the frequently asked questions page. And if you scroll down here, uh, you get to a place that eventually says, should I obtain my private pilot's license before coming to Western? Now, again, if I have a student that is going to start at a community college, I might suggest that they do that. But I'm also going to ask them to read this and understand that because not all flight training departments are, are created equal. The requirements, the expectations that we have in our flight program are very, very high. It's a very, very rigorous program. Sometimes people get fixated on, they go to Tom's Discount Flight School and all they end up with is Tom's Discount Private Pilot's License, which is very marginal and skeletal in a lot of areas. So have them look at this and read this and it really explains what they can kind of understand. Again, we don't endorse it, but we don't discourage people from doing it either. It's not a black or white uh, uh, answer to a question and there's a lot of gray areas involved into it. Um, other things that uh, uh, people, um, I mentioned the, the blog sites. So if you go to our alumni page and you can go to the blog and you can read a bunch of stories uh, about some of our alumni, the successes, the different jobs. And the, the interesting thing is we're just not focusing on pilots. And, we, and, and even if we are focusing on pilots, some of them are military, some of them are flying cargo, some are flying for airlines, some are flying for corporate and business uh, companies. There's also the business side of aviation. Um, the, the technical operations, people working in a wide variety of different areas. Uh, and then the last thing is, if uh, you want to read about some of our students, you go to About Us, go to the general blog, and you can read about a number of our students that are out there as well. So number of resources out there that really kind of paint a more holistic picture of what we do in the College of Aviation and uh, things like that. So I'll turn it over to Sharon. Good morning, everybody. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about when is like the best time to transfer um, some resources out there that can help students um, looking to take classes at the community college and transfer. Um, timing is everything. So like Tom was saying, currently we're doing admits to the flight program in the fall semester only. Um, somebody interested in flight might only want to do two semesters at the community college prepping themselves for a fall transfer. Technical operations, kind of the same thing. That program is very sequential. The sequence of courses actually begins during the fall semester and it's three and a half years of intense time in the lab. So somebody doing technical operations would definitely wanna look at a fall admit to Western. And so again, they're probably only gonna be looking at maybe two semesters at the community college. Um, aviation management, on the other hand, um, because of the, the series of business courses, those students could probably do three semesters at a community college, meaning we could find three semesters worth of coursework that is gonna transfer to the program. So what that means is students interested in aviation typically aren't, aren't getting an associate's degree and then coming here because completing that whole associates means they're gonna be taking extra courses that they don't need that aren't gonna cart in our program. So then for that student, we'd wanna look at the reverse transfer so that if, if there's somebody that wants that piece of paper that says, I have my associates, you know, then we would look at what things they can transfer back and get that, that actual two year degree. Um, but none of our programs really lend themselves well to a full two years at a community college. Again, like I said, they're going to end up taking some courses that they don't need. Now, I don't use Zoom very often, so bear with me. I was going to show you, are, are any of you familiar with where to find our transfer equivalencies on our admissions website? Okay, so I started on the main, ad, a main admissions page. Um, clicked on transfer and discover guides. It takes me to this neat page that lists all the community colleges. I'm gonna to go to Kalamazoo Valley because I deal with them a lot. So we'll, we'll just use them as our sample. So when I'm on the, the KVCC page, I scroll down a little bit. Um, the major guides, that's usually the first starting point. So if I click on major guides, um, I can go to aviation, and it lists courses students can take. So right up here at the top, WMU courses, um, it lists some courses that are taken by all three of our majors, like communications, statistics, the calculus applications, physics, and freshman writing or English. 
then it kind of it kind of breaks down by major. So it lists a couple of courses that are flight only. It lists some additional courses that are management only, and then it lists a course that's tech ops only. Um, and then from there we would talk about essential studies. Um, and so if I back out here, I'll back out twice. Um, I can actually click on the essential studies guide for Kalamazoo Valley. Now this transfer guide actually lists all of the essential studies equivalencies. Um, the good news is that in our program, our students don't need to necessarily take all 12 of these categories because classes that they take in their major are gonna satisfy some of the categories. For example, writing, that was already on our guide, English 110. Oral and digital communication, um, we're gonna find something for them to take there in their major that will use this. So the, so the student is probably gonna to wanna to connect with us because we wanna make sure they, they make the most efficient use of their time in terms of taking classes because they're not gonna to need to worry about all 12 of these categories because like I said, some of the classes they're gonna take in their major that are required happen to satisfy these categories. Um, the easiest way, we're a small college. So right now we're a staff of two. Um, I'm gonna stick out there in the, the chat before we're done our email address, um, which is avs-advising at wmich.edu, but I'll, I'll type it into the chat. Um, so if, if you or your students have any questions at all, um, have, we'll direct them to that email. Um, Bet, our advisor, monitors that email. She primarily does the flight. So if she gets an, an email request for management or tech ops, I'm the primary advisor for those two programs. She'll forward them along to me and, and I'll respond. Um, but, but to keep it simple, that's the, the, probably the good email address to use. Um, so again, we're more than happy to work with any student trying to help them come up with the best plan to make the best use of their time at the community college, because we know school costs a lot of money and we want to make sure they're taking everything possible that they can bring into us. So I guess at this point, we're going to answer your questions. So Sharon, I have the first question or the first comment point, I guess, um, looking okay. at the, the Valley Guide. Um, and I know the MTA is a huge thing. So we push all the community colleges to advise our students to pursue because they get the MTA stamp and they come here. We don't have to worry so much about West because again, it satisfies levels one and two. Um, if, if a student were to come in with the MTA stamp, would that be, I mean, again, I know we may not know how many extra courses they took if it's necessary, uh, but that is something that we probably might see with some of our community colleges, because again, they may not realize aviation is, was on their radar at first when they start their community colleges. Okay. Generally, they start with general studies, which is really following the MTA. So um, I guess just speaking on that, to that note, is there anything else you could add to the MTA or what? Um, and, and definitely we can work with that. So if they come in with the MTA, instead of all these categories here, the only ones they're going to have to, to satisfy through Western are going to be down at the, the bottom, local and national perspectives and global perspectives. Um, so we try to use as much as possible. Like for example, our program requires interpersonal communication. If a student took public speaking, I would sub that in for interpersonal. So, so we have a little bit of flexibility, not a lot, but again, we wanna try to, to help the students as much as possible. Um, but yeah, if somebody is following the MTA, I mean, I wouldn't discourage it. But if somebody tells you, for example, they're really interested in technical operations, really two semesters is all they're gonna to wanna to do. So we get them in here as a false start to get them right into our sequencing because no matter how much they transfer in, they're still gonna be looking at three and a half years to get through that tech ops program with us. That makes sense. And, and, and I like that, I guess this would be a great, um, great time to mention that these articulation agreements that we are working on and we love to, to bridge out can really clarify exactly which courses a student can take direct, you know, depending upon the path they're taking. Because again, they have three options if they're looking at aviation. So 
I would want to encourage them to, to follow the guidance because just looking now, we could easily just, it looks like they could qualify easily for their math if they take the right math courses. So that way, which will also apply to our program. So again, this is where talking to the advisors at our partner colleges, it's, I want to stress, we have set math courses that will apply to our majors that they can take that would also satisfy the MTA. Yeah. But any old math in the MTA will satisfy the MTA and, and work for our gen eds, but may not satisfy the requirement for aviation. So that's why I think these guides and pathways that we can establish would be mm -hmm. perfect. So all I, three I think of that's our majors have the same math requirement, which is math 2000 calculus yeah. with applications. Um, so calc one will also work. Physics is a little bit tricky with us because the physics that our students take is called elementary physics. And basically that physics is a combination of physics one and physics two. So if somebody comes to us from Kalamazoo Valley and they took physics, I think it's PHY 111, that's only physics one. We're actually missing the second half of the content. Physics one is uh, mechanics and heat. Physics two is magnetism, electricity, and light. So we're always happy to talk to any prospective students to make sure they understand they, depending on what community college, they may have to take two physics classes there to equal what we cover in one at Western. And that's a great, great point because right there, there's your math requirement, your science requirement that they would take if they take the right courses mm -hmm. um, at Valley for this example. So that's, again, this is why it's really important for, for us to work with our, with, with all of you and try to maybe establish very clear, um, articulation agreements, I think we could actually come up with a very clear pathway if a student were to come to you day one and say, hey, I'm thinking about Western's aviation programs, we could then clarify exactly what they need to be taking mm -hmm. um, and make that through. And, and Sharon, thank you for mentioning that you have that flexibility too. So if a student were to take a certain course, if it's close in, say, you know, covering one of our West requirements, Sharon does have that flexibility to say, yes, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to take that and check that off. The Another one we'll day. see a lot is most schools teach macroeconomics before micro. Now, our flight program requires microecon. If a student comes to us and they took macro, I will sub that in for micro. Um, so that's where we, we have a little bit of flexibility. Well, that's, that's great to hear. Thank you. Well, I'm going to stop sharing and see what kinds of questions everyone has. Hey, Sharon. Uh, and then forgive me if you already asked, how many students do you typically accept? Are you planning to accept for a fall semester for flight? I'm going to let Tom answer that one. So tech ops and management will accept as many that apply. So in flight, um, <laughs> we have an internal number. Uh, we haven't publicized it yet. We're still waiting to see what the applications look like um, and how many of them are viable, uh, things like that. But it, the number that has been thrown around is that we are going to accept or that we want, our target is 75, um, which is very, very low. Normally what we had been accepting, uh, we had classes of 225, 250, 275. Uh, that were coming into flight um and this was a compromise because there were some people that said we'll take some people said zero <laughs> some people said and then it was 50 uh and so then we we focused in on 75. uh we have not publicized that that is not that is not information that that we are asking people to please kind of keep that somewhat confidential because we don't want uh, we don't we don't because we also don't know. And then there's also a lot of misunderstandings about what that 75 means. So it doesn't mean that we're only going to admit 75. That means that based upon our yield rate, where we normally yield about 30% of the students, we may actually accept 300. Now, when we start playing that kind of game, when we offer admissions to 300 students, we also have to honor it. So um that could mean that we could have 100 kids show up because we offered them admission so but our target is about 75 for the for fall of 2023 so at this point is it just safe for us to tell our students that it's limited enrollment that they need to do the application limited enrollment 
Yep. And, and I would, and the most important thing to do to it is tell them, do not hit the minimums on the application. Uh, we have run into that with a little bit of our first time students that what, because this is the first time that I think at Western's ever had to do this. Um, and so uh, for our first time students, um, you know, they say, well, the application didn't require an essay. It, it, and so you have students that, and, and I, I always, this sounds awful when I say that, but they're like, it's Western, you know, I don't need to have all this stuff. I'm not trying to get into Harvard. Um, and so they just put the, 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 the minimums in there. Um, but the, with our aviation flight program, we are, um, there is a specific set of criteria that the admissions team is looking at. And so the student really needs, and for transfer students, looking at adding in all of those additional pieces on their application, utilizing it. So if asked for an essay, I'd put an essay in. Letters of recommendation, I would offer letters of recommendation. Um, and I would encourage the students, understand what it is that you're, you're doing. You're trying to go to be a, a, come a, pref, a professional pilot. And so what do professional pilots and what do captains need? They need leadership, they need communication skills. So what are some of the things that you have done in your, uh, in your uh, your your academic and your personal resume that you can add to this to that application to make yourself as desirable as possible. Um, we do understand that there are a wide variety of different experiences, um, and so some people will sit there and say, "Well, you know, I couldn't get in, engaged in in activity X, Y, or Z because I was at home taking care of my grandmother or my." my baby brother or sister. Well, there's a lot of responsibility that comes with those things. Um, and that's the other part of being a professional pilot is you're operating an aircraft. There's a tremendous amount of responsibility when you're operating an aircraft. If you're at home taking care of a family member or a grandparent, a loved one, sick member of the family, whatever, there's a certain degree of responsibility and commitment that comes to that and dedication. So we're looking for commitment, dedication, um, um, uh, professionalism, leadership, communication. We're also looking for things that a student might have done that demonstrates that they're going to be successful in the program. I'll, I'll give an example. We have had uh, international students that have come to us and then uh, in their culture, uh, they were not allowed to access vehicles. Uh, and so they come to us uh, wanting to fly airplanes and they, they've never even driven a car. Uh, and they've had very, very challenging times trying to make that that adjustment into it um you know so we're you know students that have um, mechanical aptitude or they have uh, uh participated in aviation experiences maybe they're a part of the experimental aviation which is called eaa um maybe they're part of an eaa club um maybe they go and donate their time or they volunteer their time at the local airport or the at an air show you know, sometimes students will sit there and say, well, I just was volunteering my time. I was, I was out picking up trash after the, uh, the air show. That's huge because general, most people aren't going to do that. People who love airplanes are going to there so they can be around airplanes the, you know, we always say they love the smell of jet fuel in the morning and they want to be around it, you know, uh, morning, day and night. So, you know, adding all of those things into their, their application and making themselves as desirable and as marketable as possible. Does that help, Heidi? Thanks, appreciate it. I think I guess I'd, oh, I was gonna mention one thing, the, where we've been seeing some increased interest where some of the conversations I've had recently um, it would be on the tech operations side of, of, from our partners. I still think that's an area that we could definitely really kind of take a look and see if we can identify students who might fit that pathway really well. And if we can maybe, in a way, find a way to reach those students who, who maybe make that, uh, who would be a good fit for the program and get in touch with them early on when they first join your institutes, it'd be great to find a way to introduce them to, to, to this option. I just don't think that a lot of students are realizing this is a, a, a possible pathway, a possible career for them, and one that with such uh, exceptional growth <laughs> um, in, in, in future for them all. So it's one that we really like to communicate a little bit better outside of aviation, aviation flight science. That is well known. I think we get a lot of publicity on the news recently. It's always there. 
I don't think that one's one that that we we struggle having students interested in, but I don't think they really see technical operations as 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 another option. I, I think there's a lot of students missing out on a great opportunity. So I am always open to any discussion or um, any ideas that we can better utilize um, getting the word out because I think it's it's a a great career track for a lot of students, um, especially those looking to maybe kind of you know work with their hands and kind of you know don't necessarily see themselves initially sitting behind a desk. Um, but like Tom said, 10 years from now, um, having our program, um, the one that they chose, that, that gives them a, an option when you know life slows down and they don't wanna be necessarily turning the wrench anymore. Um, we definitely have a position or, or a future track for them to look at. So I, I put my email in the chat and there's, you know, the other thing that I would encourage if you have students that are interested in aviation, uh, I also put in the web address for to set up tours. Um, now we are in aviation uh, because uh, the I gave you the expedited uh, 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 version of our presentation. The the one that we usually give students is a lot longer because we have to get into we, we got to get deep into the weeds, especially when we're talking about the FAA. Getting a degree in aviation is never, it's not like getting a degree in history or economics or even engineering, because we have all the regulations that we have to follow with the FAA. And so we need those students to be aware of those. So even getting into the the the, the technical operations, we have to follow the, the part 147 rules of the FAA, which requires us to have 1900 hours of contact uh, with our the tech op students and so that, going back to Sharon that's why we have a very structured those labs they have to come in if they miss a lab they got to make it up it's it, it's a very very rigid process that we have to follow so we are we do strongly recommend and, and you know get on our hands and knees and beg students you know please do the our virtual visits with us prior to just showing up um, because the last thing that we want to do is, you know, a student coming in saying, well, I didn't know about that. I didn't know about that. Uh, I mean, we all probably uh, have experienced that sometime in our career path. And so if you have someone that's interested in any, any aspect of the aviation program, um, you know, share with them, encourage them to do our virtual visit. If they still like what they hear and Western's still on, on our radar, uh, we are doing, we do in person tours. We do them every single day, Monday through Friday. We do those virtual visits Monday through, uh, excuse me, Monday through Saturday. And we do the virtual visits Monday through Saturday as well. So, thanks, Tom. Uh, any other questions? Uh, you can post in the chat or feel free to, to unmute and ask away. Well, then on that note, um, if you guys do have questions that come up, of course, you can either reach out to myself, Tom, Sharon. Feel free. Um, you have your contact information. It's always available on on the site too. If you have students interested, of course, send them our way. We Love to have those conversations and make sure that they're well in position. We have one. Yes, we'll we'll be getting some presentations out from all the all the ones we've held this week. We'll be sending those out to all the participants um, so you can share them with your teams. Well, I appreciate everyone um, joining us today. Um, we'll have more of these college sessions in January. This is the last one for the calendar year. So we'll we'll let you all kind of catch up with your 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 lingering task before you can break for your for the holidays. Uh, but if there's anything we can do, again, always feel free to reach out. Um, That's why we're here. We're here to assist you and your students. So again, I appreciate you all coming in um, and helping, um, helping us uh, show you some of the things that we're doing here at Western to help your students. And Colin, I just threw in the chat the link to the, the Prezi. Uh, hopefully you can click on that and, and get right to it. So excellent. I'll copy that down right now. <laughs> Thanks everyone for joining us. Have a great holidays.